Hey guys, today what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the settings that I change as soon as I install Proxmox. So in specific, we're gonna be looking at things that I think will apply to a lot of users. So not necessarily virtual machine-based things, but more so Proxmox-based things that I think everybody could get some value out of if they potentially change some of these settings. So this is in follow-up to my video last week on the home server that I just built. If you wanna see that, I'll leave a link to that video in the description, but we are gonna jump right into it. And the first thing we're gonna take a look at is right off the bat, the very first thing you're gonna to get to as soon as you install Proxmox. So this pop-up is here designed to just tell you that you don't have a valid subscription. So normally what you have to do is click okay through this. And then at that point, what you're gonna do is go in and kind of just use Proxmox the way you would. So what you generally do is set up the no subscription repository for updates and stuff like that. But what I like to do is run a Proxmox VE helper script. So there's a bunch of stuff that you can do here, but the very first thing I generally do is run this post install script. Now, never just run a script without actually verifying it. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do this. What I am suggesting is that you go through the script and make sure that you understand exactly what you're doing by running this script. For me, I've done that, so I will proceed. But what I'm gonna do is go back to the shell here and I'm just gonna paste that in and then I am going to run it. And as soon as you run it, it runs through and it's basically just gonna ask you a few questions. So do we wanna start it? Yes, we do. Do we wanna correct the sources? Yes, we do. Do we wanna disable the enterprise repository? Yes, we do. Do we wanna enable the no subscription repository? Yes, because this is what we're gonna to do to actually get updates. So we're gonna click yes here. Do we wanna correct these packages? If you're not gonna use Ceph, doesn't really matter. I'll press yes here. If you're not going to actually use these, I suggest using no, but that's up to you. And then do we wanna disable that subscription nag? That was the very first thing we got to. Yes, I normally do that. And then you can click okay if you wanna support them, which I suggest that you do. The next thing is for high availability. I'd suggest that you don't disable high availability just in case you ever wanna configure it in the future. I will be setting it up in the future, so I'm gonna disable that. But if you have no intentions of doing it, you can disable it if you'd like. And then the final thing is to update Proxmox VE. We're gonna click yes. And then basically what that just did is it went and it disabled the repositories that we don't wanna use. It enabled the repositories that we do wanna use. It disabled the actual nag that we've been receiving, and then it just goes through and it updates Proxmox. So we're gonna give it a minute here to fully update. And as soon as it's updated, it's gonna ask if you wanna reboot it, and I do, so we're gonna click yes, and now Proxmox will reboot. Now the first thing that you're gonna see as soon as you refresh, once it reboots, is that the nag is gone, which is amazing, and everything has been updated. So that's the very, very first thing that I normally do. You can go through and manually do all of that, but that script just makes it easier, but again, Go through and check the script yourself. Don't just trust a random guy on the internet suggesting that you do that. Now, the next thing I like to do is configure the drive that I'd like to use for my virtual machines. So the actual disks I use to set up Proxmox, it really just runs the operating system. I will set up a different disk that normally runs the virtual machines. So in this case, depending on what you're doing, you can realistically use any of these options. I'm using ZFS because there is a chance in the future I'd like to use replication for high availability. So replication just takes the virtual machine in its current state and it will replicate it to a different node from one node to another node so that you can configure high availability without having to use shared storage. If you have no idea what I'm talking about right there, it's not necessarily important that you use ZFS. But if that sounds like it's something that you could potentially do, you kind of have to use ZFS if you want to use replication without shared storage. So since I want to do that, I have an NVMe drive in my actual home server that I'll be utilizing. And I'm just going to come in here and select create ZFS. And then this is the actual drive that I'd like to use. So the other thing that's important is that if you are using replication, the actual storage has to be named the same across all of your nodes. So for me, I usually use VM underscore data. I selected the drive, everything else can stay as default, and then we are gonna create it. And at that point, we have a disk that we can use for our virtual machines. So that's the second thing I like to do. And at this point, Proxmox is kind of configured. I can go through and I can create virtual machines on that specific disk if I want to. But there are a few more things I like to do. And the next one is around networking. Now this is gonna be a little interesting because it's really dependent on your specific server, but I'm gonna talk through mine and hopefully you'll be able to 
makes sense of exactly what I'm saying in your environment. So for me, I have two network cards and I have the actual NIC on the motherboard itself. The NIC on the motherboard is this ENP 7S0. That is the one on the motherboard. That's what I'm currently using. That is a two and a half gig connection. So these first two are SFP plus ports for my 10 gig connection. These next two, we are not going to look at. These are reserved for a future cluster. Now cluster networking, you generally want it to be outside of your actual Proxmox networking on its own kind of dedicated offline circuit is kind of the best way to think of it. So we're not gonna take a look at these, but what I wanna do is right now it's using the two and a half gig connection for everything. What I wanna do is I wanted to use the 10 gig connection for everything. But what's more important than that is I wanted to use link aggregation. So I want these two to be used, which isn't gonna combine them, meaning that they're both 10 gig connections. We're not gonna have a single lane of 20 gig networking, but we're gonna have two kind of lanes on a highway is the best way to think of it. So we have two 10 gig connections where traffic can pass through. So. To make it even more complex, what I like to do is I like to use link aggregation on these two, but then I like to set up a second bond. So the first one we're gonna set up is for link aggregation. We're gonna set up one bond for these two. And then I like to set up a second bond that basically says, if these two are offline for whatever reason, the switch goes offline, the cables break, whatever, we're gonna fail over then to this specific two and a half gig connection. So we're actually setting up two bonds and we're gonna quickly talk through all of this, but it will make more sense in a second here. And the very first thing that you have to do is come in here and remove this bridge port. And then at this point, basically everything is at a default state without being assigned to anything. Do not apply these network configuration settings. What we're then gonna do is come in here and we're gonna create a bond, a Linux bond. We're gonna call it bond zero. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in both of these slaves. And we're gonna change this to LACP and they suggest that you use layer three plus four. So this is the actual configuration for the network card. Again, there are two 10 gig SFP plus ports on this specific card. And what we're doing is we're allowing Proxmox to utilize both of them. If they're both online, it will utilize both. If one of them is offline, it will automatically use the other. And then the second bond we'll talk about in a second. But what's important here is that these have to match here. And then the actual switch that you have has to be configured as well. So what we're gonna be doing on the switch itself is we're basically gonna be configuring link aggregation on the switch as well. So link aggregation has to be configured on Proxmox, but it also has to be configured inside of whatever managed switch you're using as well. So for me, ports three and four are what are plugged into the home server. And at that point, if I scroll down, what you'll see is that we're switching. You can only select one port. So we're selecting port three. And then what we're gonna do is change the operation from switching to aggregating. And you'll see that we're aggregating ports three and four. So everything else can stay the same. If you wanna modify any of these settings, you can, but realistically, all we're doing is setting up this aggregation. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna apply this. And then what you're gonna see is that these are now aggregating. Proxmox is still available because we technically haven't applied any of these network settings. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna create it and then that very first bond is created. But what I said earlier was that I want to actually fail over from this bond to this other network interface here, the two and a half gig NIC, if it ever goes down for whatever reason. So we're gonna create a second bond as well. And then the slaves are gonna be bond zero and ENP seven S zero. What we're gonna do is change the mode to active backup, and then we're gonna make the primary bond zero. So again, this says that if this bond goes down for whatever reason, you're gonna fail over then to that other network interface. And we're gonna create this, and at that point, everything is configured except for the bridge. The bridge is what we use for all of our virtual machines and stuff like that, so we have to actually specify one of our bonds. So we're gonna specify that active backup and we're just gonna call it bond one because we want to use the active backup, which is actually using a bond inside of it. So we have two bonds set up. We're using the active backup, but we're using the first bond, meaning bond zero as the primary. I know it's a little confusing, but as soon as you apply that, you should be able to apply this configuration and assuming that everything is set up properly, 
everything will kind of stay working as long as you did everything properly. If you didn't do something properly, you're gonna have to go in and modify some of the network settings. So what we just did is we set up Proxmox to basically say, use this pro aggregation switch as the primary. If it goes offline for whatever reason, you're gonna fail over to this secondary, which is what the two and a half gig NIC is actually plugged into. So what's very, very important with this is that you have to have your STP priority configured properly. So for STP priority, the lower it is, the higher the priority it is. So the closer to zero it is, the highest priority. So technically, this is our router and firewall. We have that plugged directly into our aggregation switch. And then we have our Promax 24 plugged into the aggregation switch as well. But the priority for this is that the highest priority is the aggregation switch. So that has a higher priority than the actual Promax 24 PoE. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to look that up. It's a little involved, but you're really just changing the priority. And inside of here, you'll see that this aggregation switch has a lower priority than this specific Promax 24 PoE, and that's what we need. The reason I'm showing you this is because we have to actually come into Proxmox and we have to make sure it uses STP. So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna change this network interfaces here. And basically, whatever we just did in Proxmox in the GUI just comes in here and changes a bunch of stuff, but you cannot change this through the GUI. So we're gonna go over to this bridge that we have and you're gonna see that bridge STP is off. We have to turn that on. If you don't turn it on, again, you're gonna run into network loops. So the only other thing to say is that if for whatever reason you change your network settings and then you found out that you can't access anything, hook up a monitor and a keyboard to your Proxmox server, and then just come in here and change this bridge ports from whatever you changed it to back to whatever it was. As soon as you do that, I like to come in here and just reboot the node. And then at this point, that STP priority will be utilized and just about everything we did from a networking perspective is done. Okay, so now that we're rebooted, everything from a networking perspective should be good. So there's two more things that I like to do. In the data center here, I like to configure backups, but in order to configure backups, you need to configure storage. So we're gonna add NFS storage. You don't have to use NFS, but this is what I like to use. So what I did is I gave it an ID and I also gave it the IP address. And then what we're gonna do is on my Synology NAS, I'm just gonna set up some basic NFS permissions. The actual IP address that I'm using is 10.2.1.11. And then everything else here can stay as default. We are gonna save this. And as soon as we save it, if you come back to Proxmox and you select the drop-down menu, you should have exports available. And I'm gonna be putting this all on the Proxmox folder on my Synology NAS. So I like to just specify everything here so that it can use everything if needed and then I add the storage. Now at this point, our Synology NAS is added. So I like to go to backup and I like to add a new backup schedule and basically just select that every single day, I normally specify this to be around two o'clock in the morning, I back up all of my virtual machines. Now the other important thing to do here is set up retention. So you don't generally wanna keep everything and keep in mind this does take up storage space but somewhere between seven and 10 days is normally good. You can specify as much of this as you want, but overall set up all my virtual machines to back up every single night and I specify a specific total number of backups to keep, click create. And then at this point, I can't tell you how many times this has saved me because at this point, everything just backs up automatically. And if I ever have to roll back, I'm rolling back within the past day it all runs, it's automated, it's run this way for years. Cannot recommend this enough. You don't have to use a Synology NAS. You can use any NAS device that supports NFS. So the final thing I like to do is not gonna be something that's very common out there, but I like to do it. So I have a bunch of VLANs configured on my network. And it gets confusing as soon as I have a lot of virtual machines, because I don't know what specific virtual machines are on what VLAN, I don't know what IP address they have, etc. So I have a very basic policy I kind of like to use. In the options here, you can set up tags. So what I do is I come in and I create tags for my VLANs. So I'll come in here, this is a trusted VLAN, I'll set a color, let's call it blue. I'll come in here, I'll set up a second one, we'll say IoT, pick another color. Come in here, set up a third VLAN. So surveillance, set another color. 
And then at this point, what I do is when I configure a virtual machine, I can use these tags. So click OK through here and then come in here and set up a new virtual machine. And what I can do is I'm just going to call this a test virtual machine. But all my virtual machines, I always set them to be an IP address higher than 100 and normally lower than like 250. So I'll set up a VM ID and we'll say it's 110. And at the end here, I'm just going to click finish. I'm not going to start it. But what I like to do is when it's created, I type in the tag that this relates to. So this is our trusted VLAN. So every single time I see trusted in my head, I know that the subnet I picked for that is 10.2.1. 1 .1. relates to the IP address that it is. So I know the IP address of this server is 10.2.1.110. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do this because if you have a pretty basic setup, you might not have to, but it is so incredibly helpful to be able to look at this interface and know exactly what IP address is assigned to each virtual machine and Linux container that I have. So that's kind of the fifth thing that I like to do and something that I think could be helpful if you kind of model it the same way. So those are the five things that I like to do as soon as I set up Proxmox. Now there's a lot more that you can do and there's a lot more that I do as well. But the problem with some of these other settings is that they tend to be a little niche in terms of exactly who it applies to. I mean, in all honesty, the networking stuff I did is a little niche as well, but I think it might make sense for some people out there, especially with devices that are coming out now, having multiple network interfaces, it makes sense to learn something like that. But generally, these are the five things I like to do. And if you wanna see an advanced thing, some of the advanced things that I do that might not apply to everybody, just leave a comment and I'm happy to make that. If you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys next time.